No, but that's what I thought. I thought people at this level were like tracking their food every day and that I would be training nine sessions a week and it would be like absolutely exhausting. And it is sometimes, but I've found a way that it works for me. And it's just not, I think what I expected when I looked up to these lifters growing up. Welcome to the other three years, a show for anyone who has an Olympic sized dream they want to turn into a reality. Hi, and welcome to this week's episode of The Other Three Years. My name is Christy Wagner, and this week is a super fun episode of the podcast. We have guest Olivia Reeves. So Olivia will be competing at the Paris Olympics in weightlifting. Olivia's awesome. She is a true rising star. So she competes in the 71 kilogram weight category. And most recently, she won the gold medal at both the 2024 IWF World Cup in Thailand and the 2023 Pan Am Championships. In 2023, she also won the bronze medal at the World Championships. And she's poised to have an awesome showing in Paris. But more than that, it was just so fun to chat with her and get to know her, hear her background, how she got into the sport. And I was just really impressed by her ability to know herself and her body and do things that work for her rather than being influenced by what those around her are doing. It was really great to hear the differences between weightlifting and rowing. There are kind of a lot, but I'm just excited for all of you to hear from Olivia. She's fun, but also a fierce competitor, and it was a really great conversation. But before we get into that, here is an update on what is currently going on in my training. So we are still in Princeton, New Jersey, training another couple of weeks before we head over to Europe for our pre-camp before the Olympics. Everything is definitely getting a little bit more real. We are starting to do, you know, a little bit more like press and media. There have just been more people at practice. Um, We've started getting some information about the gear and stuff. But also practice is just starting to get a little bit more intense, um, which is really exciting. And practice has been going well. Last week, it was very warm in Princeton. So I am excited this week is already a little bit cooler. It's wild that like in the 70s and 80s is considered cool, but it was really hot last week. We are really fortunate to have a lot of barbecues and like host family events the next couple of weeks we had one at old host families of Sophia's this weekend they made us pizza and it was really really good honestly they made so much amazing food it was awesome and just like a really nice chill Saturday evening this week we have PNRA where we were in Princeton they're hosting a barbecue for us which is really nice they do it every year and it's super fun and just relaxed and chill and then we also have another host family barbecue so I'm here for the backyard barbecues honestly I think we get to go swimming at one of them I'm I'm excited for that so just sort of rowing recovering fueling rowing again (laughs) or erging or lifting I think it's going to be a little windy a few days this week, which is excellent preparation for the Olympics. You know, doing everything we can to make our sessions as good as they can possibly be. And, you know, trying to have a little bit of fun in the process and, you know, just doing all the things we got to do in the U.S. before we go to Europe. For me, that always includes like buying things on Amazon that I'm not really sure that I need, but in my mind, I really need them. I have bought so many books because I'm like nervous about all of the bus rides we're going to do at the Olympics, but I'm also now a little bit nervous about how many books I'm going to need to bring to Europe with me. I might need like an extra bag just for the books and maybe I'll just leave them places, leave them for the next person to find. I've been watching every night. It's very exciting. We had swimming trials and diving trials. Now we have track and field and then gymnastics. So I've been watching all of that. My complaint to NBC would be, could you please make it earlier? Like, why is it on so late at night? I understand that track and field is happening on the West Coast, but it's just kind of wild. Like it's so late at night. I assume it's for primetime viewership, but you know, a lot of people work from home now and you can stream everything on your computer. So they should just make it earlier. If I was in charge, that's what I would do. I like literally think more people would watch if it wasn't on at 10 PM, but that's just me. Now it is time for my conversation with 
2024 Paris Olympian Olivia Reeves. And here we go. Olivia, thank you so much for being on the podcast. I'm super excited. Of course. I am excited to learn a lot. So yeah, I thought we could start by maybe just sharing how you got into weightlifting. So my parents owned a CrossFit gym. And through that, Olympic weightlifting is a part of CrossFit, just like functional fitness, gymnastics is what CrossFit kind of embodies. So through that, I wanted to get better at CrossFit. So I started Olympic weightlifting to supplement that. Turns out I just like it way more. I (laughs) didn't enjoy running aspect or cardio at all. And that's not a part of weightlifting. So I just kind of stuck with it. Went to a couple local competitions leading into a national competition. Then I went to a training camp at the Olympic Training Center. And after that, I was just kind of sold that this is now my sport. Wow. That's awesome. So your parents own a CrossFit gym. Are they also like, do they do Olympic weightlifting at all? Or are they more CrossFit specific? They, uh, yeah, they own the gym till about 2019. So they were big into, we watched the CrossFit games and all of that, but they never really got into Olympic weightlifting specifically. It's really just me and my sister who do Olympic weightlifting specifically. My younger sister is more of a I have two younger sisters. So one of them is a lifter and the other one's more of like a track and field, soccer, baseball, basketball athlete. Yeah, I was going to ask, did you do any other like those sports growing up? I mean, through my middle school, I did soccer. I did basketball. I did track and field and cross country kind of before my pre CrossFit era at 12 years old. So I tried a little bit. I don't think I was really good at any of them. I remember one time the, somebody told me this years later who was on the team. It was Charlotte who told me that they would get together beforehand on the um, the basketball team and be like, all right, this time get the ball to Olivia so Olivia can score a goal or a a basket in basketball. <laughs> and I didn't know that until years later, but I didn't realize how like I'm not very good at it. <laughs> Those seem like good teammates though. For sure. That's okay. Rowers are like notoriously bad at hand-eye coordination sports so I I was on like the D soccer team growing up so I I understand the struggle that still seems like I I guess I don't really know but that still seems like a little bit young to be getting into like CrossFit you know weightlifting that kind of thing like were there a lot of other kids your age doing it there was a couple so because my mom owned the gym she had a CrossFit kids and a CrossFit teens class that um we would participate So essentially, like I grew up in a gym, I grew up around that environment. Instead of watching football games on the weekend, we watched like CrossFit competitions. It's just kind of what we did. And there were a couple kids from my school because their parents had known my parents and they go to the gym. So, I mean, it was just like another sport any other kid would do. For me, it was just CrossFit because my mom ran it and I wanted to, I wanted to be better at it. So I don't think it was ever weird. It was just kind of like what I was doing. Yeah, no, that's awesome. I just have to imagine that like technique is super, super important, right? Especially when you're like younger so that you don't get injured. Did you feel like you had like an advantage in that being around it from such a young age? No, maybe yes. I think just being able to understand what like a workout means and how to the maturity of being able to have the attention span for class, I think just developing as a young athlete um, was important, I think. I mean, technique is a big deal, but for the CrossFit side of it, you're not lifting a lot of weight. You're not doing it super heavy. All you're trying to do is put your body in positions that will help you later on and translate to your sport, whatever sport that is. So it's not like I would say I was doing anything super dangerous. It was pretty watered down version of CrossFit. Uh, But I think helped with my background to get into Olympic weightlifting, because when I talked to Steve, my coach, who's been my coach since the beginning, and I walked into his gym and I was like, I can do CrossFit. Like, I know what Olympic weightlifting is. I can do it. I didn't say it to his face, but he I just like thought I didn't need his help until I realized that if this is going to be my sport, I need to be receptive to technique changes, criticism, but I just thought, I just thought I had it. (laughs) I did not. (laughs) When you first got into 
Olympic weightlifting, were you just like, oh, I really want to be competitive in this immediately? Like, did you feel like the competitive aspect of it picked up really quickly or did you just enjoy doing it? And then that kind of came later. I just enjoyed doing it. I think even still, I enjoy the sport. I enjoy where it has taken me. And regardless if it had gone to this level or not, I think I would still be lifting because I I like being strong and I like the way the sport has progressed and developed me as an athlete and a person. I think that's like the background you need, right? To then take it really far. Mm -hmm. So if you don't enjoy what you're doing, like you can't put put in the time that's needed. That being said, like at what point did you kind of start to see big aspirations within the sport? Yeah. See, I've been doing it for eight going on nine years, weightlifting specifically. And it probably wasn't until 2022 when they started the qualifying process for the Olympics that I realized that I'm now competing with people who I looked up to in the sport, who are trying to make this next Olympics, who have already gone to one. And now I'm kind of in it with them. And I'm, instead of looking up to them, I'm looking at them. I'm on these teams with them. Um, And it was at that point that I started realizing that, yeah, I'm trying for the Olympics, but like, maybe it's actually a possibility. Like, I'm not just trying. It's, it's pretty real. Yeah. I saw, you know, online that you had a lot of success in the like juniors circuit. Mm -hmm. Did you feel like that competing in juniors and then like competing in seniors was a pretty natural transition or did you feel like there was a big change making that switch? For me, I don't think so. So weightlifting is split into age categories as long as weight classes. Youth is 17 and under, junior is 20 and under, and then senior is 35 and under until you get into like masters. I was making senior teams as a junior, which is... Not very common. It's happened to a couple people. So I didn't find the transition. It was really seamless for me. Like as I was aging out of a junior my last year, you know, I was also making senior teams. Um, For other people, it's not that seamless. It takes a couple years to actually develop that strength and to actually play with the big dogs in a way. I think it helped being competitive and at the international level at such a young age, I think helped into my senior years. And just being comfortable on a stage really helped. But other than that. Yeah, because I have to imagine that the competitions are like somewhat similar. Yeah, I mean, I don't know what a rowing competition looks like. Do you know what a weightlifting competition looks like? Only from like the things I've watched of yours online. (laughs) (laughs) But like in rowing, weather plays like a massive effect on what we're doing, you know, but I assume that that doesn't happen. In, in weightlifting indoor sport yeah <laughs> so in weightlifting every competition is the exact same format um you have three snatches that's the wide grip from the ground to overhead and you have three clean and jerks that's the more narrow grip to the front rack and then overhead so you get three attempts at each you get a minute to do each attempt so if your clock runs out and you don't make the lift then it's a no lift you can meddle in the snatch the clean and jerk and the total which is your snatch plus clean and jerk So at a weightlifting competition, you weigh in two hours before you go to introductions, then you start warming up and the bar on the platform, the weight only increases. So as you want to take an attempt, you can, they have a system and you write it down and then you'll take the attempt as the bar keeps going. And it it happens, it's going to be the same at the Olympics as it was at our seven qualifiers. It's, it's all very standard. Do you enjoy that? I do, um, because it's very predictable, but it's predictable because I know what I can expect, but it's also a bit of a strategy because you can, you're counting attempts. You can't warm up too fast or too slow because if you're, then you're not ready for your weight that's on the competition platform. So it takes a lot in the back room that people don't see because the camera's on on the platform in the front, but I like it. I, I love competing. That's my favorite. What do you love about it? I like that it's almost like a performance in a way, and you just get to show off like your training. And I just have so much fun being on the platform because when it's when it's a good day, I'm having a lot of fun. If, I mean, because if it's a bad day, that changes things. But yeah. <laughs> and so what was the qualification process like? You just mentioned seven qualification. Yeah. So... Weightlifting had an Olympic 
uh, trials back in 2016, but because of a bunch of drug testing issues, they've changed the system for the 2021 Olympics and the 2024 Olympics, and they'll probably change it again. Um, so instead of having athletes compete just one time to make a team, they had seven qualifiers, of which two were mandatory. So the other five, you had just had to pick three. The reason they had us compete so often was that so everybody was subject to drug testing more often in competition. So they could potentially catch those positives, just say that they're testing more athletes more often instead of one time at an Olympic trials, because not every country has a USADA. So sometimes the only times these athletes are being testing is at a competition. I did all seven, didn't have to do all seven, but I did because that increases your odds every time. If you want to have a good day or do a total, well, you've got seven opportunities. I took those opportunities. If you're probably an older athlete, you're not going to do that. You'll probably train through a couple competitions. I'm on the younger side. I went ahead and did all seven. I assume the U.S. also has to qualify like for the spots at the Olympics. So was that within mm -hmm. this same? Yes. So for Olympic weightlifting, a full team is three men and three women. Of the five weight classes, there's only a top 10 are going in each weight class. So the U.S. not only has to have an athlete in the top 10, but the U.S. had an athlete in the top 10 in five weight categories. So they can't take all five. They have to take three women max. And we had a girl in the top 10 for like each weight class. And so they have to take who's ever closer to the top of the weight class, potential medalist. Because there's only 10 lifters per weight class, that's 10 countries. Can't have two countries in the top 10. So not only do you have to beat out other people in the world to be on the 10 list, you have to beat out other U.S. lifters who are potentially trying to one-up your spot because the U.S. is actually really good at weightlifting where the women's team at least is in the past couple of years since, probably since I've been watching, so 10 or so years, we've really progressed and are sending full teams and we're expected to medal. How do you feel about having those expectations on you? It's good and bad. Good and it's helpful to be motivating. But also talking to Jordan Delacruz, who is on the Olympic team for 2024 and was on the 2020 Olympic team, she went to Tokyo and didn't have the best day. She was set to medal and a lot of people, and to no fault, were just telling her that it's going to be awesome. You're going to have the best day. You're going to medal. Like, don't worry about it. Like, you're, you're just going to be great. And she was, but she just didn't have her best day and she bombed, which means she missed all of her clean and jerks, which is a tough day for anybody. Nobody wants to bomb. So listening to her and her talk about it and just realize that she's going for the experience of the Olympics. You're still an Olympian no matter what happens on competition day. And you get to take that away regardless of a medal or not. I think it's good to keep that in check that it's, it's possible. It could happen, but it's not why I'm there. I'm still grateful to be there in a way. Yeah, totally. And uh, what does it mean to you to be going to your first Olympics? I feel so excited, but I'm not really sure what I'm excited for because I haven't been to one. And this people talk about it. They're like, you just can't, you can't explain it till you're there. And I'm like, well, all right, I guess I'll just, I'll just wait till I get there. But I'm, I'm pretty stoked. How would you describe it? I mean, I, I only went to the Tokyo Olympics, which was very like COVID, you know. Yeah. But yeah, I mean, I think it's just super cool that it's not just your sport, right? We all compete at World Cups or World Championships or whatever for our sport, which is also really, really cool. But the Olympics, it's like the best people from every sport, from every country. And it's just such like a celebration. So I think that just makes you feel the moment and like the gravity of the moment. But I'm excited this time to be able to go to watch other sports after we're done competing. And I think actually get to talk to other people like because of COVID, people were so nervous to, you know, for good reason, right? To like talk to anyone. And that makes sense. Yeah. Are you guys going to any sort of like pre-camp or anything? Well, so we leave the States July 17th. And we'll be there till August 11th. So opening and closing ceremonies. Weightlifting doesn't even start till August 7th. So we'll be there a while, just hanging out in the village, acclimating to the time difference, I think is their excuse for having us go over so early. 
we had a camp, went to Colorado Springs in May when they announced the Olympic team. And in one week, they're sending us to nationals is happening. I'll compete just for fun and so will a couple others. And so we'll get to hang out there and train. Yeah, our pre-Olympic camp will be at the Olympics just for a while. And what does like a normal sort of week of training look like for you? So I train four times a week. I do Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and Friday. Leading up to competition, it'll go down to three times. Um, for about like two hours is pretty standard, pretty average. Um, if you talk to other weightlifters, they train a little bit more. They do, it's not uncommon to hear six to nine sessions a week with sometimes double days doing a morning and afternoon. But everybody has a different style of training and it also depends on your coach and how they want to approach that. I've had the same coach throughout my years and we've trained three to four times for the past eight years, fairly consistently. And because I train less often, I'm able to go heavy more often, which gives me more confidence in the bigger lifts. And therefore I can be more prepared for competition. It's just a way that we've found that that works with me. I've tried the double days, the six to nine sessions a week. And if anything, for me, it's too much volume. It breaks me down really bad. And then to ramp it back up, back to competition, it's just not, it's not my style. So for me, that's, that's what it looks like. Like, would you only go to sort of your competition level at a competition or would you ever do that during practice? Probably would save that for competition, but at the same time we go heavy and we'll try and hit PRs in training. Um, so if it's a good day, we'll take advantage of that. It's not like it's a good day. We'll save this for competition sometimes, but most times it's, if it's a good day, then go for it. And, but also that's Steve's philosophy. It's not everybody else's. So it's a little different. You're in school, right? How does that like fit in with training and comp competing and stuff? So far I've been able to balance it. I've been a full-time student the entire time through middle school, high school, and now college. I have 18 credit hours left, so I plan to graduate this December. I plan to take a full semester after the Olympics, so we'll, <laughs> we'll see how that goes, but that is my plan at the moment. I'm a student and an athlete. I'm not a student athlete through the university. So as long as I like talk to my professors about where I'm going, I have a competition here, I'm going to be gone for the week. They're usually pretty good about it. And so like, that's the support I get from them, which is nice, but I've never really had any issues and they're, they're pretty flexible working with me through that. That's awesome. And you major in exercise science, right? It was exercise science. <laughs> now it's sociology. I've changed my major four or five times. So it's hard to keep up for me too. Yeah. That's okay. I changed my major many times in college. Sociology though, that's really interesting. Yeah. I wanted to, I picked exercise science and before that it was like nutrition and before that it was kinesiology. And then, so it's been a, in that exercise realm. And I think I chose it mainly because it just aligned with weightlifting. And as I just continued schooling, I was like, I don't see myself being a strength coach, because that's really what an exercise science degree means. And then unless you like want to go get a PhD and do something anyway. So I wanted to find something else that wasn't really weightlifting related so that whenever my career ends, I have another field that I can connect and it ties a little bit, but it's not, I don't want to stay in the weightlifting community forever. I think that's good and very healthy. Yes. It took a, took a while for that to, to sink in. Speaking of, are you planning on just like continuing to compete post Olympics? Or are you going to take a little bit of time off? I think if anything, priorities will just change instead of lifting being the number one priority and building my school schedule and any schedule around lifting. I think maybe I build my schedule around school starting in the fall to get that done. And yeah, I think my priorities will just change for a semester. And I'll still continue to train when I can. I enjoy lifting. That's how I work out and keep myself healthy. So I think I'll stay probably about three times a week. But if I need to miss a day for school or something, like I'm not going to be too pressed about that. I think my next competition goal would probably be there's 
a world championships in December. So right now with my total, I'm qualified and I'm on the team. So I think I'll probably accept that unless something changes and that'll be my competition after the Olympics. We'll see. Do you have a favorite of the two lifts that you do? I prefer to train the snatch, like to do the snatch in training I like, but I like clean and jerks in competition because on clean and jerk is the heavier lift. You can do more weight there. So in competition, it just feels lighter. It doesn't feel as heavy as it does in training. So I prefer those in competition, but I just like snatches. They're just, they're easy. Not, they're not easy, but they're just so much faster and they're lighter. This might be a stupid question, but in training, do you do like other lifts or do you only train for? Yeah, I do other lifts, like other strength and conditioning workouts you would do. The back squat, front squat. I also do variations of like a power snatch with an overhead squat or um, a power clean. Like we'll change it up quite a bit. Usually in my workouts, there'll be at least a version of the snatch, a version of the clean jerk and some sort of squat workout. Sometimes the order changes of what we do just really depends on what we're working with and kind of what point and how far away we are from a competition determines how hard a workout's going to be on the day to day. But yeah, I mean, I'll do shoulder press. I'll do some RDLs. I don't do anything too crazy for ex- accessory movements. Pretty, pretty standard, but yeah. Yeah, how, how important is like prehab or like PT or any of those things? Do you do, do you do that kind of stuff? I do a little bit. I do hot yoga every week just as a fun way to just move in a different way. Weightlifting is really repetitive. You're doing the same movement. I imagine rowing is too. You're just over and over and over again. So overuse injuries are very common over here too. So trying to move in a different way, work on my mobility, just to do something else that's not lifting related, not having that impact, I think helps for me. In addition to cupping or acupuncture, just as a recovery and preventative measure, I don't have any injuries at the moment that I'm dealing with. I've been relatively injury-free for my career. I think that helps that I don't train so often. My body can recover and I have days to rest. So just as a preventative and recovery, acupuncture, cupping, massage. Those are good things. I was just talking about how I think I should do hot yoga more. That's hilarious. Yes, I love it. I love it. It's also great, like, a lot of people in weightlifting for, like, weight cuts and stuff, they do sauna. And I think that this is a good way to just get your heart rate up, sweat a little bit. It's just an hour. I can do anything. It's just an hour. That's awesome. Yeah, I don't want to get, like, too into the weight category stuff. Like, we have weight categories in rowing as well. I am an open weight rower, so we can weigh whatever we want, but our lightweights have to weigh in also two hours before. And that's like a really big part of what they're doing, especially like the weigh in or, you know, cutting or whatever, and then refueling. Is that a really big part of competition? Are you normally like closer to the weight that you need to be? For me? No. So I'm in the 71 kilo weight class. I sit 72, 73. Like, because I'm competing at nationals next week, I've, I'm weighing myself and tracking my food a little bit more. Um, so like I was 72.5 this morning and having that is, it's beneficial for me, but not, I would not say it's the case for every athlete. Weighing in two hours before means you don't have a lot of time, as you know, to recover and replenish anything that you've lost, to try and make that weight. So I usually try to wake up a little bit under 71. Usually my sessions, it just so has been in the afternoon. These past couple of competitions, I'll wake up and then eat a little something, check my weight again. I'm right on point and then go take the bus to weigh-ins. And it's pretty, got a routine down that I like. That's good. It hasn't been like kind of an, an issue sort of sport-wide? Yes. I would say for youth lifters, if youth lifters weigh in over their weight category, they're automatically moved up. They don't have the opportunity or the option to be like, oh, let me just go spit or sweat a little bit more. I think that is beneficial. I don't think really youth or junior lifters should be cutting anyways. I think at that level of the sport, you're there no matter what to enjoy it and have fun and putting pressure on athletes that young to make weight is not setting you up for success in the sport in longevity at all. So 
I think it's a little bit of an issue. I think we're getting a little bit better about it, um, of just not sharing so much about behind the scenes. Cause if people are sharing about their weight cut, then other lifters who look up to them are looking and like, I have to weight cut to be better. I, in order to be stronger or more competitive, I need to weigh less. And that's not always the case. Um, you can move up a weight class and get stronger. That's always an option. It's not if you're maybe qualifying for the Olympics and you're at that level, but at a national level or even youth and junior international, like it's always an option to get stronger and allow yourself that opportunity to get to the next weight class and fill that out and be a healthier person. So I'm a big advocate for not really cutting. Oh no, total. I totally agree. And especially with like social media these days, I feel like people see things and they're like not getting the full story, but they kind of latch on to like a little bit of information and that just can make some really unhealthy habits. Definitely. So people who do weight cut in the smaller weight cuts are less, are more hesitant to share, which I think is fine. It's their, it's their system. It's their body. It's how they want to go about it. That's fine because people will take stuff. They'll run with it. What would you say like would be your advice maybe for some younger athletes that have big ambitions? What are some of the things that have helped you over the years? Being patient with yourself and your body as you grow and develop to be an athlete. It took at least eight years for me to get this far and it takes people even longer and there's no rush really. If you enjoy the sport and you have a good coach and you have a good system, support system, you can last longer than you think and be competitive internationally or nationally. I would say just be patient and give yourself some grace. It doesn't have to be so hardcore all the time. It's not for me. I try, I try not to make it that way. I don't think you can like operate like up here all the time. You just burn out. No, but that's what I thought. I thought people at this level were like, tracking their food every day. And then I would be training nine sessions a week and it would be like absolutely exhausting. And it is sometimes, but I've found a way that it works for me. And it's just not, I think what I expected when I looked up to these lifters growing up. Those are kind of all the questions I had. I don't know if there's anything that I like didn't ask you about that, you know, kind of came to mind or. I don't know. Do you guys for rowing like weightlifters people always think i guess just female weightlifters that we're like aggressive or we're mean because we because we lift weights and that's our sport are there any like misconceptions about rowers or anything that it's like oh you're a rower you're x y and z i think people think that we're just crazy because we like <laughs> train so much and people are always like oh you must wake up at like four in the morning and i'm like no we don't do that but it's also a very like East Coast, like Ivy League sport, you know, just really old and yeah. traditional. And I do fit into some of those sort of stereotypes. So, but it's definitely not that way anymore. So I think some of those things are a little bit tough. Well, I, you told me that sometimes people ask you questions. So I did come up with a few. Awesome. I guess for those who aren't from, who are from the weightlifting world, maybe watching this and are not from rowing. Do you want to talk about you and like talk about your accomplishments and like why you are a big deal? Oh my gosh. I don't think I'm a big deal. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, I, I row. Um, I've rowed since I was like 14. I guess similarly to you, like at the beginning, I just did it because I really enjoyed it. I thought it was super fun and it made me really happy. I really like being part of the team and everything kind of after high school and college where I did row, I wanted to like pursue it, see if I could do it at the elite level. And, um, it did take me a little while. And unfortunately I had some like injuries along the way, but yeah, now I've been on the team since like the Tokyo Olympics and super excited to go back to the Olympics. And like you were saying, I think there's like big expectations and, and pressure, but I think also like as athletes, we put a lot of pressure on ourselves. So I think it's an interesting mix, right, of like extrinsic and intrinsic motivations and pressure and that kind of thing. So. Good answer. <laughs> I also, people like to ask like what my hobbies are just because they, I mean, like 
I do have some hobbies, but weightlifting and school take up most of it and then my dog. So do people ever ask you your hobbies? And if so, what do you say? Do you have like real oh. hobbies outside of rowing? I'd say this podcast is my hobby. <laughs> I like riding my bike, which maybe is not really a hobby because it probably counts as, as training. I do like cooking, like baking. I would say the podcast, which has been super fun because I've gotten to connect with like so many different people. And I think it's been a really cool way to sort of share like my journey, but also get to talk to all these different people from rowing, but also like tons of different sports. So that's been a pretty good hobby, but I want to hear your hobbies. That's a good question. I should have asked that question. <laughs> Well, I kind of hate that question because then I'm like, well, um, <laughs> I lift <laughs> and then I go to school and then I hang out with my dog and we go on walks or we hike or do some sort of enrichment activity. <laughs> <laughs> my sister and I are roommates, so we'll hang out and do stuff together. I mean, you can consider hot yoga a hobby. <laughs> I do that fairly often. No, I definitely, I listened to a couple of your podcasts before I accepted and I was like, all right, I like, even though I'm not a rower and anything, but I'd still find things that I relate to as an athlete. So no, this is, this is a cool hobby. Thanks. Yeah. It's been actually super cool because talking to people from like really different sports and people will say things and I'm like, oh yeah, I feel the same way. So I think that's also <laughs> been like a super cool I don't know if like personally validating is the right way to phrase it, but you're like, oh, okay. Like I'm glad other people feel that way or, you know. Yeah, I'm on the right track. Next. So how do you prepare for competitions? Do you have any rituals or do you do like visual visualization techniques or anything? I mean, because in weightlifting, like you can visualize yourself making the lift, walking up to the platform, the warmups, like that. That's usually how I think we utilize it mostly. And any rituals you have like for your competition? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, we do a lot of visualization. We'll do sort of like race walkthroughs on the water, just not at the full intensity, but also like especially right before I'll sort of just like go through it in my brain. Yeah, like how you want your race to play out. Mm -hmm. I Well, I eat a very specific breakfast, which I, I eat like oatmeal on toast, which I think people think is weird. I do that every day, but I also do it on race day. Yeah, I don't know. I have like a lucky sports bra. So, okay. you know, I, I do that. It's funny, like at this point in my career, I think I've either had horrible performances when I've done everything that I like to do, quote unquote, mm -hmm. but I've also had really good performances when I've like messed up some of the things. So I do like to do things in a certain way, like listen to certain music or whatever. But you also have to remember like, oh, even if these things don't go according to plan, it should still be OK. Yeah. Yeah. Do you do anything? Yeah. So usually what I'll do is, so like we have a singlet, you have to wear the singlet, but right now it's the trend to wear leggings <laughs> under your singlet. So I'll wear, I already know what I'm going to wear to competition. Like that's packed in my bag in case like my checked bag gets lost or whatever. Like I am ready to walk off the plane and compete if needed. But I have all that planned out. I, it's my favorite socks and my favorite sports bra and my favorite scrunchie. So like, even though it's not the same every time, it's just my current favorite at the moment is what I'll wear. And then I'll braid my hair. I just do the same hairstyle every time because then it's like out of my face. I don't have to think about it. It's set. And so it also works out that it's a purple scrunchie that matches the sports bra, which will also match my nails and toes that will be painted the night before. Wake up in the morning, weigh in, check weight, and then I'll do my hair and my makeup and that'll all be done. Because I think for me, it's a little psychology behind like, if you look good, you feel good, you perform well. Plus like people take pictures and stuff. So I enjoy, I enjoy doing all of that and being in the right headspace to be like, now I get to compete. Like now I'm just, I'm so excited. I look amazing. Let's go compete. Those are like physical things I do, I think. Yeah, I think it's true though. Like you got to feel confident. So whatever helps you get there. Exactly. Yeah. I actually read a book and in it, it was talking about things you can do just to like help your competition, but not help, but help you be prepared for competition and focusing on more of the process of a routine you can establish. And it just makes it all go smoother. If you can plan out time in your day for things you want 
to have or to be done, then it works out. No, that's definitely true. Well, thank you so much. And th those were good questions. You could be a podcaster. Thanks. <laughs> we'll be done competing. So hopefully I can come see you compete because you said you're the second week, right? Yeah. So I can be August 9th at 7.30 p.m. in Paris. We already know date, time, and session. I'll be the 71 kilo A category. When do you guys head there and when do you lift or lift? <laughs> when do you compete? <laughs> You don't want to see me lift. Um, <laughs> all <laughs> limbs and no strength. <laughs> You're good. <laughs> we're going to like a pre-camp in Italy. We like always go to the same place. Um, so we're leaving July 5th, I think. Then we go to Paris the week before. And then rowing is the first week. And so then we're done the whole second week. We can just like stay and go to other things, which is pretty cool. So you guys just have like one race? Like, we just have one competition, that's it. Oh, really? Yeah. Yeah, no. So we have, it would probably be, like, three races. We have heats, and then you can progress right out of the heat into the semifinal. Or if you don't qualify out of the heat to the semifinal, you go to what's called the repechage, which is a, like, French word for, like, last chance. So you could potentially have four races probably three knock on wood whatever um and then top three out of the two semis make the final a final and rowing is six boats it's a little different like we're fielding a full team i row in like a two-person boat and we each have two oars um there's 13 countries racing in the women's double but it's different like depending on the size boat so like the singles have by far the most i think they have like 30 entries or something and then the eights which are the biggest boats, they only have seven countries that race in that event because of like the quotas and stuff from the Olympic committee, there's like less rowers. They're, they're shrinking the sport of rowing at the Olympics. They're also trying to shrink the sport of weightlifting. I think we have 120 athletes in weightlifting this year, but it was like 200 plus in Tokyo. Wow. Yeah, weightlifting was actually almost not going to be in the 2028 Olympics. They were going to take it out because of our, so many doping violations. They actually did it with wrestling a couple years back. They took wrestling out, told them to clean it up, and they did. And then now wrestling is back in. So that was possibility for weightlifting. However, we are in the 2028 Olympics. We're good. That's because the IWF had a lot of political corruption. It was not a good, not a good time, but we're safe for now. Thank you so much. This was so fun. Of course. Thank you so much for having me. This was cool. And good luck and nationals and, you know, at the Olympics. Thank you. You as well. Thanks for listening. And thank you so much to Olivia for coming on. I can't wait to cheer her on in Paris. To leave you all this week, I'm sharing a quote from Michael Phelps because I just watched him doing all of the swimming trials and I like this quote. So it's from his book, No Limits, The Will to Succeed. And he said, if others were inclined to take Sundays off, well, that just meant we might be one seventh better. For five years from 1998 to 2003, we did not believe in days off. I had one because of a snowstorm, two more due to the removal of wisdom teeth. Christmas, see you at the pool. Thanksgiving, pool. Birthdays, pool. Sponsor obligations, work them around practice time. So I just thought that was pretty good. No days off, <laughs> except when you need the days off and then take them. <laughs> okay, thanks for listening. Have a great week. See you next time. Bye. I'd love to hear from you. So send us a topic suggestion, or if you'd like to submit a question for our Ask Christy Anything segment, head to our website, theother3years.com. Thank you for listening to this episode of The Other Three Years Podcast, part of the Bright Sighted Network. Bye.